Good morning. Levitan, welcome. Um, my plan today is to finish up chapter 9. I'm going to do some more examples of um, rotational momentum and how that's all going to work. We're going to start off with that example we missed last time on... Um, what the heck were we doing? We were doing the, we were doing the pulley... Uh, same problem with the mass on a frictionless table and a hanging mass, but now we've given the pulley some mass, so it has some rotational inertia. I think it's a solid disk, so we'll do that first. We'll talk more about uh, rot um, rotational momentum and rotational kinetic energy. We'll race some of these uh, hoops and soup cans. And then Wednesday, I think we're going to start in Chapter 10 and vibrational motion and mass on a spring and simple harmonic motion and, all, and that kind of stuff which will lead us into waves, and then we'll be done the semester. That's the plan. Okay. And we don't uh, have Ashley table. We have Roxalana. Thank you very much. Just shout out any time, and Roxalana's got the mic. If anybody else wants to shout out with a big, loud voice, and I can hear, I'm happy to hear questions from anybody. But why don't we get started with this? So this was, um, I have to draw it again, if you don't remember, but idea was you had a table and somehow there's some forces on a pulley, but I think you don't care about the forces that are on the axle. Um, you just care about these torques. So there's a torque from mass two, this tension two, and a torque from the hanging mass, M1, and tension 1. So, idea being, we will, uh, I guess, kind of define counterclockwise rotation as being positive, like uh, alpha or whatever, the angular acceleration, and you have these different forces. This is T2 pulling to the right on M1, this is T2, same tension, pulling to the left on, on the pulley and giving it some, uh, some torque. And then same sort of thing, the way tension works, it pulls inward, right? So T1 acts down on the pulley and it acts up on the hanging mass M1. And idea here is that, of course, M1 is gonna accelerate downwards. And in fact, I think what I'll do is I'll just define uh, plus y is down for this, so that it's a little easier to to uh, set this up. I'm going to find a, and with the pulley, its radius is 0 0.20 meters, and its rotational inertia is given. Actually, it doesn't say it's a solid hoop or anything. It just says 0 0.05 kilograms times meters squared. So you know its rotation. Sorry. And M1 is known to be 0 0.75 kilograms, and M2 is known to be 2.5 kilograms. Find A. So I'm going to assume uh, no friction on the top block, on either block actually. The one's hanging, so yeah. or on the pulley. So that's an assumption. Um, let's do the pulley system first, and then we'll do the M1 system. Okay. So the pulley system will look like this. We've got a circle. We've got T2, and we've got T1. And there might be some force here that we don't care about. I'll just call it F, which doesn't exert any torque. But that might hold the pulley in place so that it doesn't accelerate around. Right? Um, so we're gonna call this the axis at the center. It actually does rotate around. And the sum of the torques is going to be T2 times R, because this is the distance R, this is the distance R, uh, minus T1. Professor? Yes. 
Sorry, there Excellent. was a question, yeah. and it said, why did you define down as positive? Is it to make the tension one and two both the same sign? Uh, yeah, that's a, so that's, that's sometimes what I did in, um, before we had a massive pulley, is I just wanted the acceleration of M2, if that's like plus X or something, I wanted that, that A to be the same A as M1, so I made it positive both ways. So Otherwise, one has negative acceleration, one has positive acceleration. So, yeah, good point. Unfortunately, I'm still going to have a problem because I think now the alpha is negative, but that will just be in an equation. Um, so, yeah, really good, good point there. Okay, what are we doing here? So, um, alpha... Remember, alpha is equal to the sum of all the torques divided by I. So it's going to be equal to um, R over I times T2 minus T1. I'm going to call that like equation one or something. And in the M1 system, um, you've got T1 pulling up, and you've got M1G pulling down. So the sum of all the forces in the y direction, remember I got plus y is down, uh, is equal to m1g minus t1, and the acceleration is equal to the sum of all the forces in the y direction divided by m1. So acceleration is m1g minus t1 all over m1. Sorry, we have another question. Two. Yes. Um, for the pulley, yeah. why are the two different tensions, T1 and T2, um, different, whereas in the first half of the course, we assumed they were equal? Right. That is an excellent question. Um, the idea is that with a massive pulley, they have to be different. Because if they were equal, you'd have zero torque. And then the thing, so as these masses accelerate and the string um, accelerates the pulley without slipping, the pulley has to have angular acceleration, and that requires a non-zero torque. So in these kinds of problems, you don't know T1, you don't know T2, um, and you know they're different. So you're going to treat them as unknowns. They're as-needed forces, as usual. Normal force and tension and static friction are all as-needed. So you're going to find these as-needed so that the masses accelerate and the, the pulley rotates with this uh, alpha is the A over R, or negative A over R, I think. Another great question. I'm liking, I'm liking the interruptions. It's good. it's good. It slows me down a little, and um, you guys can... Oh, I forgot what, one more system, the M2 system. So that one just looks like this. You've got the normal force and the uh, M2G, which I don't care about, but I know they're equal and then the T2, so the sum of all the forces in the X direction is equal to just T2. And there's no friction, so I just say that A um, equals T2 over M2, and that's equation three. So um, we've got, unfortunately, we've sort of got a lot of unknowns here. We've got T, T2 and T1, and we've got the acceleration, and we've got the angular acceleration. So there's actually four unknowns. We need a fourth equation. The fourth equation is called uh, the acceleration constraint. Constraint, which is just relating alpha to, to A. Um, note that uh, when M1 falls, it goes down. A is plus as we've defined it, but alpha is clockwise, I think, meaning it's negative by our definition. Maybe we should have defined clockwise to be positive, but we can just say that A is equal to negative alpha times R, and that's our fourth equation. So it's four equations and four unknowns, which is good, we can solve this. It's T1, T2, alpha, and A, and we're trying to solve for A. Very 
we're good. Okay. Um, let's do it. So, uh, two will tell you that m1 times a equals m1 g minus t1. So I can solve for t1 right there. t1 is equal to m1 g minus m1 a. I can, now I have an equation for t1. I can plug it into equation one. Um, wait, I need t2, I guess three. Three just implies that t2 is equal to m2 times a. So let's plug that in there too. Um, so alpha is equal to r over i times m2a minus m1g. That's your uh, plus m1 times a. So you've got some a's and some g's in here. I'm going to um, plug into four, our acceleration constraint. And I've got the acceleration is equal to negative r squared over i times, I'll pull out the m1 plus m2 times a minus m1g. So a times, I'm trying to solve for a, so let's try to get it on one side of the equation. i over r squared uh, plus m1 plus m2 equals m1g. So the acceleration is equal to m1g. It's kind of what's driving it, right? And then what's inhibiting it is the i over r squared plus m1 plus m2. So the whole difference is that now you have to rotate the pulley as well as accelerate those two masses with whatever kind of driving you've got. And I can plug in numbers. 0 0.75 is m1 times 9.8. It's an external force. And you've got 0 0.05 you were given um, divided by 0 0.2 squared uh, plus 0 0.75 plus 2.5. Plugging all that in, I got A is equal to 1.6 meters per second squared. which is a lot less than g, which kind of makes sense because the hanging mass is, a, is less than the top mass. Okay. Okay. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about those demos I did last time today. Um, but in order to do that, I think what I want to start with is talk about the vector sense to rotation using the right-hand rule. So it sort of starts with just regular rotation. So if you have a wheel and it is rotating counterclockwise, for example, we define uh, a vector omega as being um, perpendicular to the rotation axis. So one-dimensional motion uses scalar velocity, uses scalar, okay, V, which could be plus or minus, I guess, and force. Um, a more general understanding uses vectors, uh, V and F. So similarly, we've been sort of just saying clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, you can have vectors on these omega and torque. And the way it works is called the right-hand rule. So um, we'll do it for omega. Basically, if this thing's going counterclockwise, you take your right hand, and you know that the omega vector is perpendicular to the, to the plane of rotation. So it's either, it's either towards you or away from you. But in this case, um, you take your fingers of your right hand and curl it in the direction that the thing is rotating. And so if your thumb now is pointing out, that means omega is towards you out of the page. And if you turn it this way, then you have to flip your hand in order to rotate your fingers in the direction that it's rotating now. And now your thumb's this way. So now the um, omega is pointed out of the page or into the page, I guess, <laughs> into the screen or something. That's called right-hand rule. 
And it's the same with uh, the angular momentum, L is just equal to I, which is a scalar, uh, times omega. Okay, so the direction of the angular momentum is the same as the direction of this angular velocity. So I want to try a any catalytics on this. So here we have something where um, maybe it's this piece of tape is the particle, and the whole thing is spinning, looks like counterclockwise to me. And at this point, what we do is we give it a, a boost, a push in the plus x direction. Z is up, x is out, and y is, is that way. So at that point, it's a tennis ball and a string, but it just, let's just do this piece of tape. At the point indicated below, the ball is given a sharp blow in the forward direction, which is plus x. This causes a change in rotational momentum, delta L, should be a vector, in which of these six possible directions? No vector sign on that. If you have an opinion, share it with your neighbor. Pair up, please. seconds to click in maybe. Going once, I'm going twice. And stop. So I'm liking the plus Z direction. Let me just uh, over that quickly. So, so I think it's just the idea is that that are you increasing or decreasing L, right? The, certainly the L vector, if the whole thing is rotating counterclockwise, if I take my fingers of my hand, I guess, the thumb is up and the fingers kind of curve this way. I don't know how to draw that. <laughs> That's supposed to be thumbs up or something. So L is up. Um, L increases because of this force. And so um, delta L is up. Plus that. I actually had a question. You too. Yep, so let's say L was facing in the Y. Would that chain mm -hmm. cause it to have then a change in the Y direction? So it's wherever the axis is pointing, that's where the change will be? Well, if the force was in the plus X direction, though, it wouldn't speed it up. Mm -hmm. But like, let's say it had the same setup, and you just yep. tilted it to the side. And then give it force down. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Then that's, yeah, exactly. OK. Yep. Thank you. That's correct. But then the force would be in the negative z direction, I guess, something like that. So really good. Okay. Um, yeah. So basically, if the net torque on an object is zero, then you have what's called conservation of rotational momentum. Li equals L final. And 
rotational momentum, sometimes, sometimes called angular momentum. And that's what was going on last time during these demos. So I had, uh, there was me, <laughs> I had my arms outstretched. So what that was is I had large um, rotational inertia I, and remember L is equal to I times omega, that was, that's gonna be constant. And then when I pulled the masses inwards, um, I had small uh, I, so rotational inertia got less. I began rotating at some particular value of omega um, with my arms outstretched, and then I brought the masses in. That's reducing rotational inertia. How does that affect the rotation speed? Well, it conserves L, so you have to have, so if you have small omega to start off with, then you have large omega, um, so that L times I equals I times omega must be the same. So I, I guess initial times omega initial equals I final times omega final. Something like that. That was one demo. Do you remember the second one? I was holding the wheel. So actually, just since we're on this, <laughs> let's just do a quick one here. I'll set me for one minute. Do you guys know what direction um, the angular momentum is in this picture? Do a one minute timer. Use your right hand rule. <laughs> Remember your fingers don't bend the other way. <laughs> At least not naturally. Ten seconds. So it's up, um, and if there's no external torques, and then I flip the wheel upside down, it'll then be rotating clockwise as viewed from above, and the rotational momentum of the wheel is now down. So it turns out that if I turn the axle upside down, actually I just flip that uh, L vector. So that's upside down as well. I'm, I, I must be doing some sort of torque there. So. Um, what happens to Harlow plus chair in that case. So I think what happens there is that I start, out, start off with not, no chair rotation. And so I guess there's some, uh, just a little L here. L, I guess with the wheel, um, equals L total. And then what happens is I flip it uh, upside down, so its rotational momentum is now down. There's no external torques, so the rotational momentum must still be up. So the way I would do it is maybe, so then I, I rotate counter, so I'm actually rotating counterclockwise. I might, might show it like this. Um, L, like chair, is up, and then I've got plus L wheel, because now the wheel has a downward, but the, t the sum will be L total. So that's for, for this whole situation. And the idea here is that this and this are equal. They're both up. I think that's how that demo worked. We're doing a 
Okay. How's the discussion board? We're good? Looks like Linus is thumbs up. All right. So that last topic was called rotational kinetic energy. I think it's the last thing we're doing with the word rotational in it. But you can kind of guess what the equation for rotational kinetic energy is going to be based on those analogies. Do you remember one half mv squared was regular kinetic energy? The m always turns into i, and the v always turns into omega, doesn't it? So you can imagine, whoop, it's this, one half um, i omega squared. So, so you can store energy by something rotating. Uh, for example, there's flywheels sometimes in cars, uh, and they had a Porsche 911 that was uh, using a, a flywheel to store energy inside. And a car with a flywheel, instead of rubbing a brake pad against the wheel and slowing it down, the braking system will actually transfer energy into an internal um, flywheel, slowing down the car, linear moment, linear motion of the car, but adding to some internal energy of a, of a flywheel inside. And then you can use that stored rotational kinetic energy of a flywheel to then accelerate the car again. So, and actually, let's do a quick question on this. This one's kind of interesting. This is combining two concepts. Um, a concept of conservation of rotational momentum, but now, does it change the rotational kinetic energy? So remember, um, L, if this is like L1 is equal to I1 times omega1, and this is L2 is equal to I2 times omega2, you know that L1 equals L2. But here, I1 is greater than I2, and so I think omega 2 is going to be, actually, let's do this right. <laughs> Remember, I1, omega 1. Oops, did I start it? Sorry. Yeah, I did. I2, omega 2. Omega 2 is going to be I1 over I2 times omega 1. So, did it change her rotational kinetic energy, is my question. You may have to work this out. Think about it a bit. I'm going to give you one more minute. Um, if you can solve it, tell your neighbor. Once, going twice, and stop. Survey says a lot of people are thinking that the 
gravitational kinetic energy will go up. Um, so, and I agree with that. I was hearing some conversations, but basically, certainly, <coughs> the I value goes down and the omega value goes up by the same factor, but the omega is squared, I think, and so it's more important than the I value. Sort of a compensation there. Does that make sense? So I goes down. Omega goes up. Um, omega squared um, goes up more. And what I think is that if I imagine I'm, I have those weights, when I pull them inwards, I'm actually doing work on those masses to pull them in. They want to kind of fling out, but I'm doing work with my arms to pull them in, and that work is going into speeding up my rotational kinetic energy. Sort of doing work on the system from within and converting my like, like chemical energy in my muscles to the rotational kinetic energy. Okay, so this whole chart now has a whole bunch of things. I think this is it. <laughs> this is the complete linear versus rotational analogy chart. So S, V, and A, distance and speed and or velocity acceleration become theta, omega, and alpha. The force becomes torque. The mass becomes rotational inertia. Newton's second law, A equals F over M, becomes alpha is torque over I. Kinetic energy, you know, I've got maybe K translational and K rotational. One half mv squared and one half i omega squared. And then momentum is your vector thing at the end. So I'm going to do an example where I've got a basketball that's rolling and I'm asking for what's the total kinetic energy. So a 0.5 kilogram basketball rolls without slipping along the ground. It's got some radius r um, at one V is equal to 1.0 meters per second. Uh, and M is equal to 0 0.5 kilograms. So I'm gonna, it says, what is the total kinetic energy? So I'm going to use assume uh, rolling without slipping. So that'll give us a relation between omega and V. Remember, we can look that up on our age sheet. Probably it's V is equal to omega times R. And K is equal to K translational plus K rotational. So... Professor. Uh, yes, please. Sorry, there was a question, and it says, are there any other forms of rotational energy or just kinetic? Well, I guess there might be rotational work or something like that where you do torque times the, the delta theta. Yeah. Yeah. I can think of any other ones. But other than that, the one we really use is this rotational kinetic energy. It's the only form of energy that ends up in these. So, that's a nice question. So what we're doing here, we're saying that even if it was not moving, but if it was spinning, it would have some rotational kinetic energy to it. But it's also moving. So you just add up the two forms of energy. It's got some joules from the fact that it's moving along, and it's got some joules from the fact that it has a spin to it. So it's not one half mv squared. It's one half mv squared plus this thing. Um, so I guess we're sort of done, but we might as well, we want a number, right? So I think we might uh, take i and say that i is equal to two-thirds times the mass times r squared. And we can use this whole, um, this whole thing to say that omega is equal to uh, v divided by r. So we can take omega and plug it into there. I think that's what I'm going to do is try to, try to simplify this a bit. k equals one-half mv squared plus one-half of two-thirds mr squared. 
um, times. One thing that's interesting is that they never told us the radius of a basketball. Um, but maybe it'll cancel. <laughs> so let's just keep working and symbolically. One half m v squared plus um, a th half times two thirds is two uh, sixths m r squared v squared over r squared. Hey, look, what do you know? <laughs> the r squared is canceled. <laughs> So no longer depends on what the radius of the thing, it's just all that matters is the two-thirds thingy. So it's equal to, I've actually got uh, mv squared in both of these fractions and then doing a half plus two-sixths. So I should probably do um, common denominator. I've got k is equal to three-sixths plus two-sixths is five-sixths. So the kinetic energy of a rolling hollow sphere is 5 sixths mr squared. In the case of the basketball, it's 0 0.5 kilograms rolling at one meters per second. So I get the kinetic energy is 0 0.42 joules. Okay. So let's sum up all the forms of energy we might have. You guys got this one, we're okay. So bulk motion of center of mass gives you the old kinetic energy, one half mv squared. There's remember there's mg times y where you set the arbitrary zero point of gravitational potential energy to be y equals zero somewhere. There might be a spring in the system, so there's a one-half k times x squared, where x is the distance the spring has been either stretched or compressed away from its equilibrium length. It's a potential. And now you've got rotational kinetic energy, one-half i times omega squared. Remember the thermal energy, which is plus fk times d. Sometimes that's left over at the end after there's been some kinetic friction or something. I think that was sort of it, that was the main things. Sorry to interrupt, yep. but okay. for the last slide, I believe, there was a question and it just came and it says, is the W in the equation omega or work? It's omega. I don't think I talked about work here at all. So all these Ws are actually a Greek letter omega, right? Any system, a system can possess any or all of the above and work is a way of just transferring energy in or out of a system, and there's FD cos theta. Okay, so I was gonna do this uh, racing thing. Basically, I can take a hoop, let it go down, and see what its acceleration is as it's going down. Oh, might as well. <laughs> We're gonna go back and forth a couple times. I wanted to do more of a theory thing first, but goes down. But I guess my question is, um, let's try to compare it to before. We, we already know how to do a box sliding without friction down an incline. Remember the frictionless incline or maybe the cart, frictionless cart or something? So think of a box as being like a frictionless wheels on the cart. It slides down at some uh, acceleration or gets to the end at some, some speed. How does that compare to rolling without slipping? Which will reach the bottom first? Frictionless or frictionful? <laughs> rolling without slipping. I uh, think you know the answer to this. Click in.
I was just going to say that there are some times in physics where things seem a little counterintuitive. And I think we learn physics first on the playground in the sandbox when we're kids, where there's always a lot of friction. And so it is a little difficult for us to sometimes conceptualize what will happen without friction. For example, the whole idea of Newton's first law, that something will continue at a constant velocity in a straight line. No, nobody actually continues at a constant velocity in a straight line in a, in a sandbox, right? So it's, it's, it's a little counterintuitive. So I'm asking you to think of the blocks as being frictionless. <coughs> Going once. <laughs> Going twice. Well, why don't I just... Uh, leave it on for a little bit. But what I've been actually noticing is this green box started off, B was like the least about four minutes ago, and then it's just flipped, and now people have switched to their answer. So, right. Basically, if it's rolling without slipping, it's got friction. It has static friction. So, and static friction can either be down the hill, speeding it up, or it can be up the hill, slowing it down. And in this case, static friction is going to slow it down. So that's one way of thinking about it, is that for this thing to roll like this, I think it needs, um, so I guess clockwise rotation requires a clockwise torque. So where's that coming from? What force is giving this thing a clockwise torque? Does anybody want to shout that out? Static friction. Static friction, correct. It can't be the gravity, because gravity is just pulling on its axle. Okay, the only thing that's causing it to rotate is static friction. So if, if it's applied at the bottom, which direction does static friction need to be to give it a clockwise rotation? To the left. That gives it the clockwise torque around its rotation axis right there. Okay. So remember, static friction is as needed. It's needed here to make the thing go clockwise. So it's so that and that's going to slow the whole thing down. This will slow down the um, the disc. And you can also think about it in terms of uh, kinetic energy. So if you just had a, a box sliding, well, it started off with some initial gravitational potential energy, mgh. When it got down to the bottom, it would lose all its gravitational potential energy, and it would go into, or some of its gravitational potential energy would go into 1 half mv squared. But in the case of rolling without slipping, you've got that same amount of mgh, and now it has to get shared between partly 1 half mv squared and partly the 1 half, half i omega squared. So you're now sharing that energy between the rotational and the, the linear. We have a question in yes? relation to this. So yes. someone asked, why is the friction slowing it down here while static friction speeds up a car on the road? Well, that's a great question. Yeah, static, and or it also speeds up me if I'm if I'm running. So, yeah, I, I guess that's the way static friction is. It's as needed. So, if you've got a car, there's some sort of torque which is causing those wheels to accelerate, to converting um, ener chemical energy from the the gasoline into that, and that's speeding up the car. That's as needed, right? In order to not slip on the ground, the car has to speed up. Whereas with this wheel, it's going down the hill. In order, it would, if there was no static friction, it would slide like this. But the static friction causes it not to slide, and it spins it up, so and slows down the whole object because it's up the hill. So it's tricky, isn't it? It's a good question, but it's it's like you have to look at the situation carefully and then decide what does static friction do in order to not have things slip. It's different for different situations. Sometimes it speeds things up, sometimes it slows it down. All right, let's do what time is it? We've got, we've got time to do this at least. Um, 
which is just, look, remember this? We'll do it as blue. If you've got theta, what is the acceleration of a sliding object down a ramp inclined at theta? What we do is we tilt our axes, define, this is like a final exam kind of question because it's from a while ago. Normal force is in the y direction. Mg is, is the diagonal, and you have to split it up. The A sub x is equal to the sum of all the forces in the x direction divided by mass. It's going to be the Mg sine theta. There's a theta here. This is fx, right? Uh, divided by m. So I guess the Ax is equal to the m's cancel, and you get G sine theta. Well, the next thing I'm going to do is what's the acceleration of a solid disk rolling down? Now you've got a whole different situation, which I think I might do next time. But here you've got R, and here you've got some friction. I think what I want to do, though, is let's do another learning catalytics. I'll do that example next time. But I want you to, guys to answer this one. What if we do solid disk versus metal hoop of the same mass? Which will reach the bottom first? So I want you to make a prediction, and then I have one. <laughs> These turn out to have the same mass, although it's not going to matter. But um, I guess one's made of wood, so it's less dense, and it's all filled in. The other is made of metal, much more dense but it's empty except for just the, the outer edge. So I think they're both 677.6 grams. Yeah, they both say 677.6. So just believe me. They're also the same radius. Radius the same, mass is the same. Who's going to win? Or will it be a tie? <laughs> and we'll start them at the same position, and I'll just take this away really quickly. I'll just pull it out, I guess. First of all, yeah, I want them to do a prediction first. <laughs> Although if I show it, here, I'll just write down the percentages, because if I show it, then you'll know which one I, t I colored green. Hooper disc, people. Make a prediction, going once, going twice. Let's stop. So, oh, survey says, by the way, 40% vote for the disc, 40% vote for the hoop, and 21% vote for the tie. Not sure how that works. <laughs> but anyways, let's, uh, let's, let's do it. So luckily, Nature is not a democracy, it's a dictatorship, okay, of what really happens. You just do an observation, so. Disc wins. <laughs> <laughs>